Welcome to this service for the third Sunday in Advent. A quick reminder to the people of Howwood that there is a, an opportunity to donate to the Threshold Trust. On Monday the 14th of December, the church will be open between 11am and 2pm to receive gifts. Now let us worship God. We open the service with him 313, See Amid the Winter Snow. Now let us pray. O oh God our Father, we participate in this service so that we may once again celebrate the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. We want to express our worship and our praise. Make us glad as we travel in imagination to Bethlehem. Enable us to clear a space in our crowded lives for him who at his first coming found no room at the inn. And help us to render fitting adoration to the holy child laid in a manger. Lord God, we remember how you came into our world in Jesus. We marvel and we rejoice that for all your splendour and might and freedom, you came to us so quietly, so humbly, so helplessly. You asked no privileges, you claimed no status. You entered human life as we do, 
as one of a family, as a baby to be cherished and guarded, loved and tended. We praise you, O God, for those throughout the years who prepared for your coming, for the people of Israel, their prophets and their kings, struggling to grasp the marvels of your ways until they became a cradle for your Messiah. Lord, we ask you at this time to cleanse the unclean stable of our hearts and make ready there a cradle to receive our Lord through faith. It is especially our prayer at this Christmas tide as we celebrate again Jesus' birth, that he may be born again and live in our hearts through faith. We pray in his name, and in his words we further pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we've got a Christmas tree, and it's about that that I want to speak to the children. It's actually a new Christmas tree that we bought specially this year with our granddaughter in mind. She's now two years old and we thought it would appeal to her with its flashing coloured lights, and indeed it did. But you know, we actually had it up on Monday the 23rd of November, which is very early on. I've never known of our tree to be up so early. But I think a lot of people are putting their trees up early in order to cheer themselves up, and why not? Now, this tree, as you can see, has flashing lights. If lights weren't on, you would maybe see what you can see anyway, that it's all green. Because the trees that we use for decoration at Christmas time are evergreens. Trees that stay green the whole year long. It might be a fir tree or a pine tree if you're using a real one, or an artificial one, but it's evergreen. It's not like chestnut trees or oak trees where leaves fall in the autumn. The tree remains bare all winter, and then in the spring, buds appear and grow into the leaves that we have in summer. I spoke about that back in the autumn. No, Christmas trees are green the whole year through. They're referred to as evergreens. And the point I want to make is that God's love is a bit like the evergreen tree because his love is everlasting. It means it's there for all time, for eternity. At Christmas, we celebrate Jesus' birth. And his birth is a sign of God's love for the world. God sent Jesus into our world to express his love for us. But his love is not just for Christmas. It's for the whole year long, for our whole lives long. God's love lasts forever. So perhaps each time you look at a Christmas tree and remember it is ever green, remember too God's love, which is everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn, one for the children, is hymn 300, The Virgin Mary Had a Baby Boy.
Bible passage this morning is from the New Testament, Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, reading from verse 1 to verse 7, a very well-known passage, the story of Jesus' birth. This will be read for us by Christine McCormick, who is an elder at St Paul's. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in strips of cloth and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Amen. Let us again pray. O God, our Father, we remember how there was no room at the inn of Bethlehem. And we pray for those who do not have a home of their own. And we pray with those who work with such families to find room for them in life. For charity organisations such as Shelter and all their supporters. For social workers and doctors who try to support people in such troubles. For authorities and counsellors and officials whose awesome task it is to make houses enough for all. We remember how Jesus was born of a human mother, and we pray for all mothers, especially those who have lost the joy of motherhood, those who feel that somehow they have let their children down. May your love and power uphold them and restore them. We pray for all those for whom the approach of Christmas means nothing, for those for whom it means only more work and more money, for those for whom it will be a time of heartache as they remember loved ones they have lost in the course of this year and as they remember what Christmas used to mean for them. May new light in the darkness break for these troubled souls, and so may they find the secret of true joy. We pray for those who are sick and suffering pain. Exert your healing influence through the hands and skills of doctors and nurses. We pray finally that the day may soon come when peace and goodwill exist all over the world, not just at Christmas, but at every season of the year. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, be all praise and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Our next hymn is 296, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks by Night.
At Luke chapter 2, verse 1, we read, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, this is one of the most famous passages in the Bible. It's well known by people who don't even come to church. I suppose it's been made famous through a whole host of nativity plays. Everyone knows that Caesar Augustus made this decree for the census. And of course, it meant that Mary and Joseph had to travel from their home in Nazareth to Bethlehem. It's a distance of 95 miles. Nowadays, it could be done by car quite easily in two to three hours, depending on road conditions. But in those days, the journey would take 11 days. Well, actually, it would only take 10 days, but given that 10 days is more than a week, they would take the Sabbath as a day of rest with no traveling, and so the journey really would be 11 days. They would take with them a supply of food. There would be cakes of bread, olives, cheese, eggs, and raisins. They might have used inns in the way, but in those days, inns weren't very desirable places, and they might have tried to avoid them, perhaps camping out in the open air. They would very probably walk. We usually imagine Mary traveling on the back of a donkey. Well, it is possible that a donkey was used, but you know, it's more likely if they did have a donkey that Joseph would be in the back of the donkey and Mary forced to walk. You might think surely Joseph would be more of a gentleman, but we have to remember he belonged to Middle Eastern society, which was very much male chauvinist. So the chances are Mary had to walk a long and difficult journey forced upon her because of a decree by Caesar Augustus. He took away their freedom for a reason. And that reason was that he was holding a census. Some translations of the Bible suggest it was for taxation. I actually think it was a combination of the two. It was a census leading up to taxation. But the point is this. The emperor's decree curtailed the freedom of Mary and Joseph and forced them to make a journey to Bethlehem, which was where Joseph's family originated forced them to make a journey they would not otherwise have made. That curtailment of freedom strikes a note with us at the present time. For in this past year, we have had our freedom curtailed in a way that we have not previously known because of all the restrictions and regulations that the government have brought out in connection with the COVID virus. We've recently been in level four. We haven't been able to have members of our own family into our own house, and that has been a very strange thing. And although Christmas is approaching and we've got a bit more freedom, it's only up to eight people who are allowed to meet out of three different households coming together for a Christmas meal. Things will indeed be very different this Christmas. We are having our freedom curtailed, and many people resent that. There have been demonstrations in London and other cities. What we've got to remember is the reason for it. It is for our own safety and well-being. You might feel very healthy and fit and able to fight against the virus. Fair enough, you might be very lucky. But what you have to consider is that it might be passed on from you to a close friend or family member who may suffer a worse fate and end up in hospital. Or even if your own family is free of it, we've got to consider the wider public, total strangers. As Christians, we are encouraged to love our neighbour. In the end, if the government tell us it is for the sake of the National Health Service not being overrun, we surely want to play our part in making sure that it continues to run smoothly. So we have to put up with the curtailment to our freedom. There's no point 
in protesting. It's not like the kind of protests that are going on in Hong Kong. Protests against a real curtailment of freedom by an authoritarian regime. No, it's not like that. It's for the common good. And just as Mary and Joseph were obedient to a decree from a foreign emperor, so we must be obedient to the rules laid down by our own government. But you know, God was able to use this decree made by the emperor Caesar, Caesar Augustus. He wanted his Messiah to be born in Bethlehem. Long ago, the prophet Micah had decreed, out of Bethlehem shall come a leader who will be shepherd to my people Israel. But the problem was that Mary, the mother of God's Messiah, lived in Nazareth, 95 miles away. And so God found a way to make it possible for Mary's son to be born in Bethlehem. He used the decree of a pagan emperor as part of his plan and purpose. You can see God can take things that would appear out with his control and use them to fulfill his purposes. He can take a disaster and bring good out of it. He can take our mistakes and bring good out of them. Sometimes we make unwise choices. Sometimes we disobey God and do wrong. But God can turn things around. He may have to work out a new plan for us, but he takes us from where we are and brings good out of it. This is well expressed in the story of Joseph with his brothers. You may remember we looked for several weeks in the autumn at this story. And we remember how Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt. Later on, at the time of the famine, when Egypt had great preserves of grain, the brothers came to Egypt to collect grain. Joseph confronted them. You meant to do me harm, he said. But God meant to bring good out of it by preserving the lives of many people. This is what's known as the doctrine of providence. The doctrine that God is in control and that he is concerned for the good of his people. It's something we desperately need to believe in at the present time. But it's not always easy. When a disaster occurs, we wonder where it fits in with God's plan and how it can possibly be consistent with God's love. I have to admit that I cannot come up with explanations for disasters. But we need to believe that when disasters do occur, God can take them and use them to bring good for the benefit of all his people. A few weeks ago, I quoted a saying from St. Paul, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We need to believe that that is true. We need to believe that God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us and for his world as a whole. And even when things go wrong, we need to believe that God can use them just as he used Caesar Augustus's decree to achieve his purpose. We need to continue in that hope and trust. Amen. Our final hymn today is 320, Joy to the World, the Lord is Come.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. Our finest gifts we bring, pa-ra-pa-pum-pum.